Atul ji and to the entire uh, GIIS team, students and parents who would have joined in today. Um, uh, my greetings to you uh, on uh, a Thursday evening. Uh, it's uh, unusual, it's very usual now actually to meet in this setting. Uh, I'm used to coming to GIIS on a uh, number of occasions, interacting with uh, uh, faculty, with leadership, students and parents in diverse contexts and different settings. Uh, but this is a great opportunity as before I leave to have another uh, chance to speak to you. My association with GIIS is of course, uh, as long as I've been here, which has been about three and a half years, um, right in the beginning from the time the campus was uh, quite close to where we are here in the, uh, uh, in the heart of the town, uh, to this extraordinary smart and uh, uh, and a really well-designed campus now in Congo, which is always a treat to visit, where sometimes the technology can be very intimidating for people like us, but I'm sure uh, it is a setting the tone for the young leaders of tomorrow. But it is really a, a sort of a benchmark in design of a school. It is not just a place of great uh, technological innovation and inputs, it always also has great aesthetic character, um, a, a design in a way to encourage engagement, uh, let a lot of light in, um, also provide a lot of circulation space. Uh, so it is both very open and at the same time, very intimate. And it is a well thought out design, uh, I think for uh, of the school campus, but it also reminds us of the deepest values of the highest ideals that are important for this world. Uh, because when you step into the school, you have the opportunity to see the statue of Mahatma Gandhi. And when you step inside the building, when you see the Gandhi Learning Center, which is actually quite um, exquisite because it is both Spartan as well as very informative. And I don't know of many schools even in India that have a dedicated uh, Gandhi Learning Center. And so it's, uh, it's a school which uh, I have been very struck by the vision of Atulji uh, and also by the speed uh, and quality of execution because it's one thing to have a vision, quite another thing to be able to execute uh, that vision and put it into action. Um, so it's a SCAT curriculum that I think promotes academic excellence, uh, at the same time social empathy, a sense of community service, teamwork, um, interest in sports, cultivating art and culture, uh, and a deep belief in sustainability. Uh, sustainability, I've participated in uh, quite a few events centered around uh, greening uh, the city, around uh, planting trees, around technological innovation that are designed for, uh, for sustainability practices. Um, so it is all these inputs that are very important, very critical, uh, for building the leadership of tomorrow. Because we are entering a world in which you will not only need a high degree of academic excellence, but also a tremendous spirit of innovation and an awareness of technology. Because we're really entering an age where technological changes are accelerating. It's a kind of a change that happens once in a century, once in three centuries actually, not since the Industrial Revolution are we in such a transformative uh, phase of human history? It is also essential in a world of uh, great diversity and now growing concerns about identities, about uh, nationalism and hypernationalism, about uh, us versus them, about new fault lines. For people, to, for young leaders to grow up with a sense of social empathy, a sense of inclusion, the ability to embrace diversity, and to speak for oneness of mankind. And at the same time, we are also uh, in a world where the perils uh, of, of our planet, that our planet faces is quite visible. Uh, we see almost on a regular basis, the fury of natural disasters, of uh, extreme weather conditions, uh, of the devastations caused by climate change. All of these things are uh, therefore in challenges that the leaders of tomorrow will face. And I think the school is doing a great job in building up the leadership of tomorrow, not just in terms of making them fit uh, for great professional careers, 
Um, this, so it's been always been a great pleasure to interact with the students. They've been part of uh, many events of ours uh, through these three and a half years, whether it was that mega Pravasi Bhartiya Divas uh, or in 2018 January where they ran a nice student's corner uh, with great enthusiasm and some very sharp questions to the speakers, probably sharper than the, the speakers faced in the main hall. Um, they were there for the Prime Minister's visit, which was in June 2018. Uh, and we've seen them, of course, at the mega business and innovation event last September. This GIIS, GNI, and GIS. And of course, I have to, uh, to, to remember uh, that the two students who were the uh, compares at the very solemn ceremony to unveil the plaque of Mahatma Gandhi at Clifford Pier uh, during the visit of Prime Minister uh, Sri Narendra Modi and in the presence of ESM Go Chok Tong. Um, GIS and GIS have also been great partners for us in everything that we have done. Uh, but more than what uh, they have done with us, I think I really value the contribution that the Global India Foundation and the Global in, uh, GIS has made to the Singapore society. Um, it, at different times, I know and I've seen them participate in community activities uh, that is, are contributing to make Singapore a better place, uh, and that's truly an important and invaluable contribution. In a sense, invisibly so, they are becoming part of a Singaporean society, integrated deeply into the fabric of this nation. Um, it is uh, also something which uh, I would also uh, like to take a moment to thank uh, Atulji uh, because of the manner in which he has always come forward, not just because of GIS, which has, for example, trained hundreds of thousands of uh, talent in the realm of art and culture and other areas of uh, performing arts, uh, but also in terms of social contribution. And this brings me to the point about uh, the pandemic that we've all gone through for the past uh, it's really just been, what, five months since the first case of pandemic was confirmed in Singapore on January 23rd. This has been a, a moment, and since then, we watched how the Indian community has reacted to it. Um, before I get into that, I'd like to say a word of uh, uh, compliments and uh, appreciation for the manner in which uh, Singapore government has handled this uh, pandemic. Uh, we all have to recognize that at each stage during this five-month period, we've all felt comfortable, confident, and reassured that we would be safe and that the government would be transparent and clear in the manner in which it would share information about the actual situation. Um, we have seen uh, for a moment a degree of concern arising first out of returning Singaporeans and permanent residents in the middle of March which led to some spike in the cases. And then of course the runaway increase in the incidence of uh, infection, spread of infection in the dormitories that house foreign workers. Now, we uh, have seen also how they have responded to it, uh, uh, proactively, aggressively, and in a very transparent manner uh, to contain the spread of the infection in the dormitories uh, which house nearly over 320 thousand people. So they have been very proactive in testing, in tracing, in isolating the workers who were sick, separating those who were healthy and taking them into safer uh, temporary accommodation. And in the manner in which they have responded to the welfare requirements and the social, psychological and the emotional uh, challenges that uh, workers faced when they were put in a lockdown condition in their dormitories, where they were not allowed to go to work or to step outside the dormitories, and in many cases outside their rooms. And so the government made sure that they were getting paid their salaries through their employers. They got the meal that they wanted. They uh, each had a care package which gave them a thermometer, masks, and sanitizers. There was free medical uh, facilities at each of those dormitories. And there was also very uh, detailed thinking that went into some of those initiatives. For example, they, were, they distributed over 200,000 free SIM cards uh, to those workers that didn't have access to Wi-Fi. 
they enhanced and made Wi-Fi uh, free where Wi-Fi was available. And they even made, gave them access, free access to hundreds of television channels uh, which they could watch uh, during um, their uh, period of confinement. Now these uh, deep mind, they even had messages from Rajni Kant and Kamala Hassan and Sachin Tendulkar and Shankar Mahadevan, I mean, icons who uh, send very special messages to the workers who were in the dormitories. Uh, I interacted with them, I spoke to them, I uh, went to the dorm. And uh, so they have done extremely well. The workers were very happy. And today, as we have come out of the circuit breaker, we see the situation is stable. Uh, we see that in the community spread is almost uh, non-existent. I mean, their incidence of, uh, of infections uh, is almost non-existent now. It's very negligible. Uh, but we also see that it has come down to a pretty stable level uh, within the uh, dormitories as well. Uh, so it's, it's something that, uh, that has, it isn't just the government, it has been the whole of community, the whole of society effort. Because when you look at a crisis, it is not one entity, just the state actors that can help you uh, deal with the challenges. It requires a whole of society approach in which every sector has to contribute. And each of us as individuals have to make a contribution. When we observe the disciplines of uh, safe distancing, of staying in our homes, not going to crowded places, um, taking on the responsibilities and for our own behavior, then each of us becomes a frontline warrior in the fight against pandemic. Um, in the Indian community, the Indian expatriate, of course, has uh, also made an enormous contribution uh, in the course of this period. Um, first of all, as you all, all are aware, that we've uh, the largest number of cases of infected Indians outside India is in Singapore, and that is because they are the workers living in dormitory. So we've had about uh, 15,000 cases here in Singapore. 96% uh, of those are in the dormitories. Um, and uh, that's 35% of all cases in Singapore. And that's a really large number. So we are uh, grateful to the Singapore government and to the community for their response in dealing with the pandemic, especially for the uh, workers. The community has stood up also. I know uh, Atulji has made an enormous contribution, uh, financial, and by getting his team, by uh, getting his students to, um, to, to stand behind this effort, to be there, not just in terms of financial contribution, but to devote their time and thought uh, to supporting the pandemic response. Uh, we've got some fascinating examples of uh, community organizations, of Indian associations who have uh, raised resources, who have mobilized resources, workers who've been laid, laid off, uh, those who have cooked for them. There are Indian uh, religious organizations, uh, temples, mosques, gurudwaras who have uh, contributed uh, to this effort. And there have been instances where people have actually gone and offered themselves as interpreters for workers in dealing with medical services. Uh, those who have um, done work in terms of caring for the elderly or uh, volunteering in different manner. We've had instances of, uh, for restaurants that have catered food for healthcare workers for weeks together. Um, those who have provided technology solutions to dormitory so that they could manage this pandemic web better. So there have been numerous instances of uh, the community coming together. But that's as far as the migrant workers, as far as the larger Singaporean society is concerned. But we also had to deal with a number of other kinds of challenges. For example, uh, a lot of Indians who were here uh, on temporary visits got stranded when there was a lockdown in India on the 24th of uh, March. Uh, many were elders who had come visiting their children and those who were there were those who had come for business, those who had come for tourism. In addition to that, we had a problem of a number of uh, workers and professionals who had been laid off there and their families had to return to India. There were students who had finished their courses or students who used to finance their way uh, through uh, part-time work. 
they were all very desperate to get back to India. They were, they had run out of their means. Then we had young students like you, Simran, who uh, were 16, 17, uh, who are in schools over here, but they were living in hostels and uh, they were feeling a sense of isolation, depression and anxiety. So at the High Commission, we had uh, worked with the Indian expatriate community on our own. We had taken care of a large number of them in terms of accommodation, food, medicine, and even counseling services for those who were feeling a degree of uh, anxiety, depression, and a sense of isolation, uh, being in circuit breaker condition and not being able to go back home. Uh, but also found great support from the Indian expatriate community. I mean, there were any number of Indian associations who had reached out uh, to support to those who were stranded here and those who were without means. We had groups of students for whom we had to provide dry ration because they liked to cook. For others, we made arrangements with a number of Indian restaurants to provide food. This is, but then began this big question, when can I get back to India? And it took about more than six weeks for the flights, repatriation flights to start. And that was a very trying period, very difficult period for us, as well as for those who were keen to go back. Because you wake up every morning and you do not know when you're, when you're going to be able to go back home. There were some very tragic cases, people who had bereavement in their families, people who had left behind their minor children in India. And because there was lockdown in India, there was nobody else who could go to look after them at home. There were those whose parents or some relative uh, grandparents were in the terminal stages of illness. They had cancer, they, they had uh, strokes, they had heart attacks. The chances of survival was limited, but they couldn't get there. They couldn't be with their loved ones because we take travel for granted. We assume, especially if you're living in Singapore, that there are eight flights to Delhi. There are seven flights to Mumbai. There are flights, direct flights to 15 cities. I can go there at the drop of a hat and suddenly all that was taken away from you and the value of the relationships became so critical. Uh, we had those who had come here for treatment, died, but couldn't be taken back for burial or cremation. We had to make arrangements for them uh, for their last rites to be performed over here. So they were daily tragic cases. And yet it was difficult because in India, the government could not have organized these uh, repatriation flights without a, the consent of the state governments, because it's ultimately the state governments who have to take care of quarantine and testing and, and treatment. And each many of the states which are gateway states, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Delhi, they were experiencing their own cases in were rising exponentially. And the big question was, do we cater for the needs of those who are resident in our cities or do we cater for those who come back? And remember, this is also a time when the, when the virus was on a rage, on a rampage throughout Europe, throughout the Gulf states, and in many parts of Southeast and East Asia as well. So there were these fears and for, for six weeks, we weren't able to repatriate people. And then the flights began. And it's a very difficult process. These are not your regular commercial flights. And on a daily basis, we were getting hundreds and hundreds of phone calls, uh, social media messages, email. I mean, if you open our email, it would be like a flood coming out. We tried to make sure we could respond to all of them. We also had to prioritize their, uh, their, the compelling reasons. I mean, you had women who were in the 32nd, 34th week of pregnancy. And they needed to get back before they were barred from traveling and they didn't have the means to have the delivery over here. So there were some very tight deadlines. We had the case of a person, of a lady who wanted to go home because she was in the last three days of her life, last week of her life. She was suffering from cancer. Her only wish was to be with her mother when she breathed her last breath. And it's on a daily basis we have this and we have to prioritize them because the number of seats are always limited and we have to take and everyone had to register on our portal. They had to give details about their address in India, their telephone numbers in India, because we needed them for contact tracing in India. Uh, but eventually we've been able to manage it reasonably well. We, it took us some time to get our systems in shape. There were always, um, and ticketing was always a big issue because if you sold tickets open online, it would become a commercial flight. And that would then invite 
questions on why are this Air India running commercial flights and others are not allowed to, and why Singapore Airlines not being able to. And this is a problem that Air India is now facing in the United States. Because in the US, they started selling tickets online. For here, each ticket was approved by us. And each passenger had to be approved by us. We used to give the manifest. And we had to do this 72 hours to 60 hours in advance because we had to sell the tickets. We couldn't have one empty seat uh, because Delhi would then complain. And why do you have empty seats? And why are you then asking for uh, so many repatriation flights when you don't have seats to fill? And we needed to send the full passenger manifest 48 hours in advance because the state governments needed those details to make arrangements for quarantine and for and for testing and other uh, parameters. So it's a very complex exercise. A lot of us spend the first few times in the flight at the airport. We had to get people to sign indemnity bonds, uh, assurances that they'll pay for their quarantine and all kinds of uh, requirements had was imposed on uh, by the state governments. But it all came through together. I mean, our objective was to try and get everyone back home as quickly as we could. Uh, it was always a source of great regret for us if we weren't able to get everyone who wanted to be on a particular flight onto that flight. Um, there was a great pressure from uh, the Tamil community because in the first wave of flights, there were none to Tamil Nadu, and which is about the largest population here, who are to be repatriated. Eventually, it's all worked out well. We've done 34 repatriation flights so far. And out of those 34, and it means for us, it's from start to the end, which means we have to be there till the time the flight takes off. So a lot of our officers, I, many of us spend our time at the airport managing even the departure processes. And to see if there are no shows, then we've got to get other passengers in. So 34 flights have been sent, as, as Atulji was saying, about 8,000 people have gone, but the number is growing. We thought the number would reduce as the flight spread. And that is an indication of the state of affairs because you know, obviously more and more people are losing jobs, more and more people are, are, are uh, facing difficult circumstances and would like them to go back home. And we hope that in the month of July, we will have a much larger, much larger uh, number of flights operating out of here and then we should clear the backlog uh, by the end of July. Um, so this has been an, uh, an extraordinary period. Uh, we've tried to stay in touch with our community. Uh, and I'd say this, that, you know, this, the way the community has worked here, both for Singapore and for the expatriates and for the larger Indian community that comprises those who have been here for generations, has, is in indications, a symbol of how they have been over here. As I have always said, this is must, this has to be, and I've traveled around the world, uh, the most talented, accomplished, connected, and uh, and responsible uh, diaspora I have seen anywhere um, in terms of professional capacities, capabilities, and talent. The second to none in the world, not even to those who are in Silicon Valley uh, or in New York and London, in terms of their in terms of their commitment to the community here, and in terms of their sense of uh, of uh, togetherness. And above all, their sense of connection uh, to their roots in India uh, is just extraordinary. That gives us a great deal of strength and energy in all that we have achieved over the past three and a half years. Uh, there has been, obviously, as I've been going around meeting Prime Minister, President, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Senior Ministers, and all the Cabinet Ministers in the course of the last uh, few weeks and days, uh, they have all said how much the relationship has improved in the course of three and a half years, how much uh, has the High Commission done here in terms of visibility, in terms of activities, and, uh, uh, and which all of them remember to be on an unprecedented scale. Uh, they have spoken about how much we have engaged the community at the grassroots level, which is something uh, that they deeply appreciate. But none of this would have been possible. None of this would have been possible uh, without the involvement and support of the, uh, the community, the diaspora. When I, when I came here and I interacted with people, I found that gave us the strength because the Indian expatriate community is 
excelling in every field. You look at business, commerce, trade, finance, public life, legal profession, non-government organization, social service. You look at even academia in terms of education, research and development, in art and culture, in every aspect of public life, human life, business life, there has been just an extraordinary high level of achievement. Uh, and they have yet found time uh, to give back and it manifests itself in different ways. This is one city where, for example, you can see all the festivals of India celebrate. You can live in Delhi, but you will not be able to see the festivals of South India so clearly. Here, and if you live in South India, you might not be able to experience the vibrant colors of North Indian festivals or Durga Puja or um, Dandiya, Navratra. So everything from all parts of India is celebrated here. It's a tribute to this country that it has nurtured an environment in which everyone can be both Singaporean and, and at the same time be part of their own culture and celebrate it in ways uh, uh, which they would like to. So in so many different ways, we could see that a Diwali is more vibrant here than you might find in many parts of, of India, perhaps celebrated longer than in almost every city in India. Um, you see Thaipusam, you see Pongu, you see Hari Raya, uh, you see Onam, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the Navratri festival, Shivratri, um, and I have been around to all of them in every possible community. And what is interesting is that when you see ministers belonging to different faiths, belonging to different, uh, different, uh, different races, coming to join you in celebration, and this is how they have built a society that is founded on a sense of harmony and togetherness and the embrace of diversity. So in, this is also a city which has a cultural calendar which could easily match any of the major Indian cities. I mean, this is no exaggeration to say that if you see from January till the end, some of them are, are because of this great uh, talent in the diaspora. Some of their event managers who have brought the best of best from uh, India over here. Then there are religious organizations that anchor. Then there are festivals which lead to great cultural events. And throughout the year, you will see something major happen. And that's, again, a level of involvement from the community which makes this uh, possible. Uh, similarly, this is a city where, you know, the spark of the startup community. The spark of innovation, the spark of technology is really coming from the young minds of, from India. These are young kids who've got, I will give you an example that I just experienced. There is a young fellow called, uh, who has made a device uh, which you can, which costs us $18 some dollars, which measures four parameters which are critical for COVID, uh, which measures body temperature, uh, heart rate, SPO2 and fatigue levels. And it is synced to your phone and it goes, sends the data into a central monitoring system. So engineered in Bangalore, manufactured in China and launched in Singapore. I mean, this is a, a, again, an example of what an, in, a, you know, young Indian talent can do. And I came across many examples and many of you in GIS will grow to break these new horizons, create something new and in a very fertile environment. So I think much of what we have achieved in these, uh, and there have been so many highlights we could have uh, spoken about, but all of you are aware of them. But it isn't, it wouldn't have been possible without both the support we got from uh, the community and their participation and involvement. And I have to say again, uh, definitely for record, as I've said in private LDG, your support and contribution was not just forthcoming, but it was done with so much enthusiasm that uh, it always gave us assurance that we can achieve things on scales that were unprecedented in Singapore. And we were able to do it. And everyone recognizes it here in Singapore, including the top leadership. So, and you are also the bridge between India and Singapore. You know, this is, uh, I was just telling BPM yesterday or two days ago that to sow the seeds of our future partnership, we need to get our youth together more. And you are, this diaspora has the unique ability to be an interpreter of India and Singapore, 
and in an advocate for Singapore in India. And therefore, you can be the big bridge. I've told S. N. Dharman also that if you really, this has got the best talent of the world, you really need to tap the Indian market and opportunities you need to work with them. Why is this relationship so important? It is important for a number of reasons. And I'm going to put it in very simple terms. And you'll understand what I'm saying. One, of course, is that we've always had a great relationship for two millennia. Because this is a natural neighborhood for India. We talk of neighborhood. We speak of South Asia. But look at Myanmar begins from Myanmar, Southeast Asia. We are just 60 nautical miles from between Indira Point and Andaman and Nicobar Islands and Indonesia. If you take a ship from Andamans to Singapore, it takes only one and a half days. So we're really close. And you see this when you fly from India to Singapore and back. So this is something it is important because you've got to have good relations with Nepal. Second, we are both of us share a strong cultural heritage. Singapore, I mean, identity is incomplete without its Indian heritage. That is something they recognize. There is no Singaporean identity without its Indian heritage, just as it is a Chinese heritage and a Malay heritage, and a, to an extent, even a European heritage. Now, that's a very important factor. We share so much in culture together. We also have a great future when it comes to economic partnership. Now, when you look around the world, Singapore is a country that derives its value globally. It's a small country. It cannot do everything here. It needs to have a market. India is going to be a, it's, and it has DPM Heng was telling me that India is one of the top priorities for them going ahead. But we agree that we cannot do this without human talent. We need people to go and build these bridges. It's not enough to just speak about potential. And therefore, I'm saying this for the young minds and the young people in our diaspora. You need to be that bridge uh, to say that, okay, we will be the uh, channel through which we will build this economic partnership. It's important for India's prosperity. It is important for Singapore's future. Again, when we think of all the solutions we can provide for the world, you know, the most important is our synergies, our capacities in innovation. Just as India has used technology and innovation to provide banking, insurance, pension, public delivery of service, access to healthcare, to distant learning, to, to, uh, to, uh, to diff different kinds of government services, all of these things have been possible only because we've harnessed technology in India, developed this Aadhaar, we've got this phone, We've got these uh, India stack and we've got this uh, bank accounts of 1.2 billion uh, people. Now, this is something which is a story which we are now can export to the rest of the world because there are many countries that would need a similar kind of technology intervention to transform lives of their people. We're working with Singapore to try and build what is called India stack into a global stack and use their capacities in smart nation to build that together. And again, it can be a great contribution uh, for realizing the vision of sustainable development goals. Um, we have a enormous responsibility to build peace and security in this part of the world. We all know that we are entering a world which is going to be fractious, which is going to be more contested, maybe even more bitter in terms of rivalry. And we are a people, a civilization that believes in Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family. Singapore is a country that believes in the diversity of the world. Like us, they believe in rule of law in, and, and, and a rules-based international order. We do the same. That in, as in society, as in families, in the world also, everyone must act according to established rules and law. Only then will the world be a safe, secure place in which everyone can feel they have an opportunity uh, to pursue their dreams. Now, this is something that you cannot take for granted. You cannot assume that the world will be the way we have seen it for the last 70 years. So therefore, India and Singapore feel like we need to work together with other like-minded countries to build that kind of a uh, relation world for ourselves. 
And again, this is something which you as youth can do that, which our young minds can, uh, can, 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 they are idealistic, they can dream, they are willing to push boundaries, they are not, um, they are not caught up in the baggages of the past. So it is, again, uh, an area where I feel that India and Singapore can do a lot more as we are, so whether it is in terms of building a peaceful and secure world for our children and for our future, whether it is working together for future prosperity. And remember, pandemic is going to be transformative. We have not yet understood the economic costs of this. It is going to take a year for the full economic toll to be felt. We haven't understood the in impact in terms of employment, in social challenges, in terms of uh, in terms of what it will do for families, what it will do for communities and societies, what it might do in terms of putting pressure on our social fabric. So it is important for us to find opportunities where they are to restore the economic momentum, repair the economies, recreate those jobs uh, for our people. And which is why we are now giving a higher degree of urgency uh, to the economic partnership between India and Singapore. And all I have, that I've heard in the last few weeks from the leadership and from the business community is that they have great confidence in the Indian economy and they would like uh, to do more over there, just as we encourage Indian businesses to be here. And I have to tell you, we have 9,000 Indian companies over here. Some of them are very active. And just a week ago, um, the Indian Business Forum, which makes up, which is made up of 49 Indian companies, made a handsome contribution to the Migrant Workers uh, Center for the Migrant Workers Fund. And again, it shows that their commitment to Singapore as a, as a base for their global economy. So I'd like to say this, that, you know, the future for this partnership is great. We do not have disputes. We do not have contests. We do not have doubts and hesitation. We only have goodwill and warmth and trust in this and mutual respect in this relationship. We are a country, India, that does not believe in a small country or a large country. We believe that all countries, irrespective of size, are equal and sovereign, are free, and that is the level of respect with which we must deal with each other, which we do with India and Singapore. So I think that, you know, as we go forward, I mean, particularly, I'd like GIIS to continue its great mission and the work that it is doing, uh, continue to focus on community, continue to focus on innovation, continue to focus on sustainability, besides academic and sporting excellence. Um, you have to prepare the leaders for tomorrow. And for the Indian community, I'd like to say that it is extremely important for us to first of all, feel like we are part of Singapore, that this isn't just a place where we come to work and make money and have fun, uh, you know, with our dreams in India. Yes, they may be, but while we are here, we must feel uh, we are part of Singapore. We must integrate with the larger Singaporean community. We must integrate across, across the old Indian diaspora and the new expatriate. Because that is how we will because diversity is in our DNA. We Indians are used to hearing multiple languages at the same time, living with different traditions and customs. It's natural to us. We grow up like this. And so it's very important to find ways uh, in which we become, feel like we're part of the Singaporean community, find time uh, to contribute to society because most of us who are here are relatively well off. We are doing well on the strength of our talent and enterprise and, 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 and hard work. And this is therefore important for all of us to then give back and integrate deeply with the local community. And uh, for the kids, I would say, for the young minds, continue being part of a uh, great future uh, through your continuing pursuit of innovation, pursuit of uh, building a more uh, you know sustainable planet and a more beautiful world around us um, all the best to you the gias i know has its wings spread across a large part of the region uh, so we look forward to opportunities for future interaction and to uh, seeing you scale greater heights in the years to come thank you